on Real Rovar is Gaetan Chevalier, who is not only a physicist, but is also very possibly the single individual most responsible for collecting the very important medical data to uh, assist people in understanding what happens when we ground our body to the surface of the earth. So, great welcome to you, Gaetan. Pronounce again for me, please. Thank you, Gaetan Chevalier. Gaetan Chevalier. So, Gaetan, where are you now? I am currently in Encinitas, which is in San Diego County in California. Yeah. That's where I live. I remember. And this is my home. I remember the town well uh, because I traveled through there with the woman who would become my wife oh. in 1975. Oh, and, wow. Uh, we, we were traveling together from the north down through the south of California to Mexico. So I'm in uh, Sanda near Kobe, and we've just had a really fierce typhoon pass, pass uh, through, and uh, it's been designated the worst typhoon. The Japanese Weather Bureau has designated the worst typhoon for many, many decades. Wow. And where, where you are, we know there are lots of forest fires and, and I think as a scientist you must be acutely aware that the earth uh, appears to uh, be going through a lot of accelerated changes which I'd like to talk about later in the interview but before that tell me about your science background <clears throat> yes so my science background um, I was born and raised in Montreal, Canada, in the French part of Montreal. And I did my bachelor uh, undergraduate studies gra and graduate studies at the University of Montreal at the uh, Ecole Polytechnique, which is the engineering school. So I graduated with a PhD in engineering physics with specialization in uh, laser spectroscopy, uh, optical physics, and um, anything that is related to light, like uh, also lasers. <clears throat> so from there, after I graduated, I started to work in nuclear fusion as a specialist to analyze the interaction. So in nuclear fusion at the time, the, uh, the most common uh, machine that was used uh, for nuclear fusion was called a tokamak, which is a Russian word for basically a donut-shaped device. So um, the, uh, the fusion community used a tokamak. Now there's much more variety than they used back then, but in Canada we had one large tokamak at the time, and it was in a suburb of Montreal. <clears throat> called that in and um, so I became an expert in analyzing uh, the interaction between the plasma and the uh, wall of the uh, the machine because the plasma as you can to in in order to do nuclear fusion you need to reproduce the temperature is the process that the Sun is doing so you have to reproduce the te temperature inside the Sun um, the, just to start the reaction, you, you need 10, 10 million degrees, just to start the reaction. And so it's very hot, and it's very important, nothing can hold it. It has to be held by a magnetic field. Mm. And the magnetic field has a special configuration so that it keeps the plasma inside, it, inside the machine in a donut shape. Mm. Now, this is you know, the ideal, but in reality, the plasma leaks and touches sometimes the wall. And what this does is, because it's so hot, it immediately evaporates a part of the wall and creates some impurities that emit light and cools off the plasma. So I became a specialist in analyzing uh, the light 
that um, was emitted by the plasma in order to determine what species are in there and uh, what is their concentration. That specialization brought me to UCLA where um, they needed a, such a specialist, a very narrow specialty, um, because they were doing the, it was a group that was specializing in plasma wall interaction. So that brought me to UCLA. <clears throat> and I spent four years at UCLA in two departments, mechanical aerospace and nuclear engineering. And also uh, after that, I, make my, I went to the electrical engineering department doing uh, uh, research on uh, helicon waves, which are a special wave that are able to couple all the energy that, uh, that a microwave is uh, generating into the plasma. Actually, the first people, so my boss at UCLA was the inventor of the helicon wave system. We published papers on that. And it was adopted by the Japanese first. <clears throat> they created a helicon wave machine, which is a tokamak-like machine to, to uh, create a very, uh, very sophisticated machine that was very uh, successful. So um, during my, my time at UCLA, I always had on the side a spiritual practice. Um, and well, when I was 20, um, I became a Rosicrucian, which is, you know, uh, an order of a uh, very ancient order with uh, uh, lots of scientists actually were part of it in, the, in you know, in Europe in the centuries, like René Descartes and Leibniz and uh, even Dalton, the inventor of uh, chemistry, and even Newton. People don't know this, but Newton was an alchemist. <laughs> in, in a, so I had this background too on the side, so I had a double life basically. And uh, in uh, about 1992, I read an article by a Japanese scientist, Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama, who also happens to be a Shinto priest and the head of the Tamamitsu Jinja in Tokyo. So I read an article uh, in English uh, that was published in a magazine called Share International, and in there he described the machines that he invented to measure the energy flow in the meridians, and even claimed that he could measure some effects due to chakras. So I was fascinated by that. And I just took a chance. There was an address at the bottom of the article and just wrote to Japan. And uh, to my surprise, I got a response that Dr. Mutima would be giving a lecture in a yoga studio in Santa Monica, which was not very far from where I was. So I went. It was very difficult for me to understand what he was saying. But nevertheless, at the end of the presentation, I went to him and I asked him, you know, if I could help in any way, my idea was just like, you know, on the side of being a scientist at UCLA, I would do that because it's so interesting to me. Instead, he um, asked me if I had thought uh, electricity and magnetism and, uh, and if, it, I, if I have experience in teaching that. And I said, yes, that's one of the courses that I was teaching as a graduate student at Polytechnic School. I had sometimes 75 students in my class. So I had experience. I said, yes. He said, well, it just happened that I'm starting a school in uh, Encinitas, you know, in San Diego County. And I, would ne I will need someone who can explain the physics of the machines that I invented to my students. So I said, I'm very interested. I'm willing to do that. So I went and he said, I introduced me to the dean of administration of his school. And so I started teaching part-time at, CIH, at CIHS, the California Institute for Human Science, which is the name of the school. And <clears throat> on Saturdays, I would come from, from uh, Westwood Village, which is just south from UCLA, and I would come down to Encinitas and teach a course for four hours and go back. The first class was, had three students, and it was in the fall of 1992. Little did I know 
later I learned that this was the first quarter of the school and the three students were the only three students of the school. <laughs> so a year later, Dr. Mutiama invited me to become full-time researcher at his school. And so that was a huge decision for me because it was like leaving mainstream science for, you know, frontier science, not so well. You know, some people think there's nothing to that. And it was like basically, you know, leaving a career of, you know, accepted and science to going to, you know, more like, not woo-woo science, but, you know, kind of like out there science. But uh, I understood for me that it was what my interest was. So I decided that I need to take the leap, and I did. And I must say that uh, it has been a very rewarding journey. I, I grew up so much. I learned so much about so many things. And in the process, uh, one day of 2003, there was this gentleman who came and did a lecture on the benefits of being in contact with the earth. I was at the time the director of research of the, of the school, and Clint Ober, uh, that was his name, just started talking about the benefits of being in contact with the earth, that he just had a study, that people were sleeping better, that, you know, like... Uh, inflammation was reduced and all of these symptoms and I said uh, well that's interesting but I was kind of skeptical because you know um, I mean just touching the earth and feeling so great that you know your pains are all gone it seems pretty interesting but mm -hmm. wouldn't have known it you know would not have we known it you know or I've been discovered uh, at least a hundred years ago if it was so easy you know little did i know that it was actually but it was in germany and um that was a name a, a doctor named uh, adult just who started that based on the information he has from his patient that when they were you know sleeping on the ground they were feeling better but at the time i did not know so i was skeptical Very good. but yes very good. Let me just recap this amazing uh, background story that you have shared with us because we have a lot of people who listen to these interviews who uh, may not have a sophisticated science background. Uh, many people listening will not even know the basic facts that plasma is the fourth state of matter. That's right. You know, if you say to people, well, what's plasma? Like, what? And you say it's the fourth state of math, and you go, what? We've got a solid, we've got a liquid, and we've got a vapor, but what else we got? So yeah. the fact that you've studied something that, to my humble knowledge, constitutes the vast majority of the physical universe is made of plasma. And they'll go, what? That's right. That's uh, right. Can you tell us how much of the physical universe is composed of plasma? Well, it's probably about 90%, if not 95%. It's that much because the sun is a big ball of plasma. What is plasma? It's not the plasma that you have in the blood, which is a liquid. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, a gaseous state where the, 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 state, the gas is so hot that the gas becomes um, ionized. What that, what that means is that it be, the particles become charged. So it's a plasma that is made of charged ions in molecules instead of being neutral like the air. Um, so uh, an example, of course, is the, uh, the sun. The sun is a big ball of plasma, and that's why this, the, most of the material that exists uh, in our solar system is actually in the sun. I mean, even the, the, the planet Earth compared to the sun is like a, a grain uh, you know, of, of sand compare basically to a, a building, you know, or to... Uh, yeah, I ask, mm -hmm. people, I ask people in my own uh, uh, lectures who have been to university, uh, some of them are scientists, and I ask them the simple uh, questions that are not so easy to answer. And one of the questions I love is, uh, okay, we've got a solar system, we've got a sun, 
we got nine or, or ten planets. And uh, what what percentage of the mass of the entire solar system is constituted by the sun itself? Yeah. Or to make it easier, I don't even use mass. What percentage of the solar system does the sun take up? Yeah. And people who've been to university they come up with hmm, fifty percent. Ten <laughs> percent. And people, I go. The sun's mass takes up ninety nine point nine eight percent of the solar system, baby. And they go. That just completely crunches the brains. Like, what? Yeah. And yeah. wait a minute. That means that zero point two percent is all the planets. And I said, go to NASA, check the whole page. That's the figure. Right? Yeah. And, 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 and that, that immediately shocks people into an awareness of how important plasma must be. And you, you previously mentioned it's not the, the blood plasma, but isn't it strange that what constitutes most of the solar system has the same name as what constitutes the very river that our blood thingies flow through? I mean, yeah. Like, hello, somebody yeah. tell us something about the relationship here between matter and plasma in yeah. the solar system. And that actually, for some people, may be too difficult. But if we just say that without that understanding, without the understanding of the, the electrical activity connected to plasma and how that relates to grounding or earthing, which we shall get to, yes. then you are supremely well prepared well prepared also because you're a Rosicrucian. Yes. It mean you would have to be a rebel to start with because, you know, uh, the Rosicrucians weren't very popular there in mm -hmm. a long time. Uh, so you have to be prepared to fight, to be a rebel, to, to think outside the box, but you already had the box. Yes. You already had the box that you could think out of. So that's very important for people to understand when they start saying, oh, everything is down, it's all flaky stuff. Nah, this has got nothing to do rather than stop. Stop. Listen to this man. He knows what he's speaking about. He's got the background. So we've established your background. You've met Clint Dober. Yes. Who, uh, uh, very briefly, as far as everybody else can see, he's the most central individual responsible for us knowing about grounding or earthing. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and you met him back in 2003? Two, yes. At which point the earthing book had come out. Uh, people were... Not yet. Not yet. Oh, it hadn't come out yet. No, oh. it hasn't come out yet. So It came out in 2010, oh, the first version. It's not yet. Oh, well, I'm, I'm very interested to hear when you met Clint, what happened? What did you share? So, what happened? So, uh, I l listened to Clint's lecture very uh, carefully. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, um, the benefit of grounding seems very cool, but it seems so simplistic. You know, being, uh, have been in the box for so long, we are, uh, we learn, in the box that what is not in the box is must be too simplistic you know or or is is false if it's simple and what is not be, being discovered has to be complicated mm -hmm. so something simplistic you know that hasn't been discovered yet is a red flag is something like okay something you you know you need to really take with a grain of salt and which I did at the time said, this is too simplistic. It would have been discovered a hundred years ago. That was my thought. And then I left it at that. Uh, what happened next is one of uh, his associates came, came to me and said, we would like you, you know, the Institute to sponsor a research project for us. Would you be willing to do that? And being pretty open institute, even though, you know, we, I was, my fate was not, uh, in earth, earthing and grounding was not very strong at the point. I said, sure, fine, if you want to, you know, to sponsor it and pay for it, we will do it. So we just did the project and we had very good results. We had, you know, decrease in tension. We even found 
a new phenomenon that is related to the function of the muscles, where the muscles seems to be controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Because we found, the first thing we found is that grounding or earthing affects the autonomic nervous system within a second. That's the first thing that is affected. So to us, it's like the body is noting at the, this point that it is grounded and it makes uh, uh, for a relaxation effect, immediate relaxation effects, like the body saying, ah, good, our supply of electrons is there. I mean, that's my interpretation. But we definitely see in the data that an immediate reduction in autonomic nervous system function. We use skin conductance to measure that, but we can use also heart rate variability. We did actually use other measures and found the same effect. So we really know that the autonomic nervous system is the first one to react and that the body takes note of it. And then after that, what our research show is that it's like nothing much happened for about 15, 20 minutes. It depends on the people. And then after that, you start to have a systemic response where uh, the heart rate increases, the respiration rate increases. You see blood, we even measure blood oxygenation. We found the oxygenation, the blood increases. There's a, completely cha a complete change in physiological functions. And at the same time, we see through thermography a reduction in inflammation. It took about 20 minutes. So we don't know if it's because the body waits to get enough electrons before it relaxes, uh, if it or the body is not sure that it's, the grounding is happening for real, or if it needs to accumulate electrons before starting doing something. But it takes about 20 minutes for the body to react in general. There's ways to speed that up. If you have inflammation at the elbow, for example, and you don't want to wait for that systemic reaction, you can put a patch right there where the elbow is. And within five minutes, it, sometimes less, the, the pain goes away. We've done that during uh, uh, presentations, like 500 people. We would ground about 300 people of them, you know, uh, with a single patch. And we say, okay, put the patch where you have pain right now. And so they put the patch there and the conference is going on. After half an hour, we asked uh, some people if they feel any difference. And invariably, I still remember this person, this guy who, who raised his hand and said, I had a knee inflammation and within less than five minutes, the pain went away. I was like, wow, this is pretty good. So this is what we see. So there is, you know, but systemic reaction where the body says, ah, we got it, and we have now our normal contact with the earth, and we can now start repairing the body, it takes between 15 and 30 minutes. Okay, let me just recap again, because we're looking at somebody here who may have grown up inside the box. And yes. Brought up some very important points that are absolutely impossible to believe. For, for the average person, you're saying that there's a systemic response of the body that is close to miraculous, okay? It's, it's like the body is totally going into a different... Uh, it's a different... Uh, your body. Yeah, metabolism a, a reaction. I mean, it must happen in, the, in the, some function of the brain where, you know, the hypothalamus or something where... It says, oh, we're grounded now. We can start the repair mechanism again. Yay. You so see? Here I am. I'm a doctor in, in Osaka, and I've spent my entire life looking at parts of people's bodies. You know, it, it, it astonished me when I first came to Japan that we actually had, we, we had doctor's offices with signs, and, and one of them uh, said, anal doctor. <laughs> <laughs> guy only deals with anuses. <laughs> it's Komonka in Japanese. I thought this was hilarious. How can you just deal with a hole and <laughs> the rest of the body? So, my guy spent his entire life focused there, and I'm sure he can justify it scientifically, as most scientists can. So, <laughs> one step further, and you mentioned it's too simplistic. Well, as a scientist, you must have known that, you know, uh, 
one of the, the, the core fundamentals of science is Occam's razor. Yes. Occam's razor says if you've got four or five explanations for any phenomenon, it's the simplest one which tends to be true. Yes. And, and so all science should actually still be grounded in that pillar. It yes, it should. Sounds simple. Doesn't mean it's not true, mister. That's you know, right. Occam went through a lot of philosophy. But that's... That's what our teachings, that's why the formation in science implicitly, you know, yeah. lead us to believe that, oh, any easy, because we do research and, you know, the PhD, anywhere that people are looking for good research projects, like anything easy has been discovered. We need something now that is really, you know, we can only look for something that is really difficult, you know, because the simple stuff, we all understand it. It's so easy, you know. It has been discovered 100 years ago. That's the impression we have when we are there, you know. But you step out the box and you see there's so many things we don't understand. We can explain that are simple. And so then that was a very good uh, wake-up call for me. It's like, okay, so I'm an open person, but I realized I was not as open as I thought it I would. <laughs> well, you got the results. You got the results. So the second thing I want to bring up from that last very informative a uh, bunch of information. You're actually conducting tests. You're actually conducting, you know, uh, changes in, 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 in surface skin resistance. But yes. Autonomic nervous system responds instantaneously, and yet it takes, you know, maybe 20 minutes. But if you put a patch on, and I've done exactly the same in Tokyo, I copied all of your stuff. Uh, you know, I copied all the idea about patching people before yes. and after. So I would have them come into an office in Tokyo and they'd sit down, not 500, more like 20 or 30. And I'd have them write down what's wrong with you now. Go from the top of your head, your eyes, your nose, is it blocked? Your ears, your mouth, where's the tension? You know, where you got pain? And they would write it all down. And then we'd have tables set up so that each participant had a patch. And I said, right, patch is on. And we'll leave them on for the second hour of this seminar. And then you're going to tell us all live on YouTube what happened. And it was just like you said. It was absolutely remarkable. I actually had one woman after 10 minutes went, it's gone. And I said, it's gone. And she's got a patch stick right on top of the tooth. And her tooth yeah. is gone. I mean, what are the repercussions for that for the dental industry, for example? Yes. Yes. You're an unearthing dental chair. Because yes. Because you know. I mean, the, the repercussions just are, are so huge, but it's too simple. It's too simple. Yeah, and yeah. You mentioned the magical word that connects with your research as a scientist in plasma. You said, not enough electrons. Now, wait a minute. So somebody's listening to this. You what? Not enough electrons? Wait a minute. we got to catch up here. What do you mean, not enough electrons? You want me to answer that? Yeah. No okay. Electrons. Okay. So why first do we need electrons? Yes. Good question. Right. So it, we just build that way uh, because of our planet, how our planet is. Mm. Our planet is a battery, mm. and it has an it's just like any battery it has a negative pole and a positive pole, mm -hmm. and it just happened that the po negative pole is the surface of the Earth. And the positive pole is about 60 miles up in the air. It's, it's, it's a region of the atmosphere called the ionosphere because the sun rays ionized the molecules there. Basically, the sun rays are strong enough that they can split molecules so that they become charged. Mm. And then you have a complex process that happens you know, in the atmosphere where you have these clouds formation and you have thunderstorms. And what these thunderstorms do is basically charge up the surface of the Earth with electrons. So we have a mechanism in, in the Earth, in the atmosphere, that keeps, you know, the battery recharged. Where, and where the energy comes, it comes from the sun. Mm -hmm. So the sun is providing the energy for that. Now, we have the surface of the Earth that is negatively charged. And we have all these beings and, you know, animals and plants and humans evolving over centuries 
and being in contact with the surface of the earth. So nature is very wise and took advantage of that. It says, okay, so we have, uh, we're going to devise, we're going to take advantage of that and use positive charge acids to kill bacteria so that we can, uh, we can, you know, survive. So if any bacteria or, you know, fungus or anything comes and try to invade the body, we're going to create an immune system, cells, specialized cells that will go around, carry acid with them, and just pour that on, on whatever the enemy is or engulf them and digest them with us, acids. So this is all good, provided that after that you can, you know, mop up the, the mess, basically, which is all these positive charges, you know, that have killed bacteria and everything in the, sitting around. So that was no problem. We always had infinite supply of electrons in our body that could be recharged anytime. And so the system was working very well until we decided to wear sh shoes that were made of, you know, rubber. We changed our lifestyle and we disconnected from the earth. What happens now is that we don't have the electrons anymore and the atmosphere itself is more charged with positive ions than the negative ions. So we're breathing positive ions. And our lifestyle even got us even further away by processing food. If you take a tomato from the garden and it comes directly from a plant that is grounded, this tomato will have a lot of electrons. In fact, you can measure that there's very inexpensive device that measure actually the quantity of electron that is inside a tomato or any fruit. It's called oxidation reduction potential, ORP. So you have ORP. If the ORP is negative, that means the, 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 the fruit is alive. If it's positive, don't eat it. And the food that we eat is so much processed that it's all positively charged. You know, you have all these apple pies in the states and everything that we eat has been processed so much that it's positively charged so we keep adding positive charge positive charge positive charge and this creates what it's called oxidative stress because it oxidizes you know the body and creates some problems and so one of the things that the body does over time is, well, we have all this oxidation. It's going to try to find negative charge to compensate that somewhere else in the body. One of the places that it goes where you have lots of them is the bones. So that's why we have osteoporosis. So the body tries, but in the process of getting those electrons to quench inflammation somewhere in the body, then the body loses bones and lose calcium. And so it, but it tries to survive. So the best way is to get back and grounded. And so now we have explanation, um, new discoveries in medical science that inflammation is behind most of the degenerative diseases. And we know inflammation is basically po uh, positive charges that are around that have not been quenched. And so the body you know, try to barricade that, it gets some pow pouch, you know, like Ancelier just explained mm -hmm. uh, how, you know, the body's trying to mitigate and corner the inflammation and everything. But eventually, you know, a disease happened and some problems, you can have diabetes. Even most cancer now have inflammation. I, I had a doctor who wrote that cancer cannot spread if you don't have inf inflammation. Inflammation is absolutely necessary for a cancer to spread. That's, that's, so uh, here you get it, here you have it. Increases inflammation. I have a couple of questions about what you just said. Yes. Uh, I understand uh, the negative, uh, positive polarity uh, battery uh, metaphor for the Earth. Yes. Uh, but you said that the atmosphere has less electrons and where not only are we insulated through our uh, rubber plastic footwear, uh, which is a very important point that when I met Clint, he actually brought that up and he showed mm -hmm. me a graph of the uh, 
emergence of all of these very complex diseases like multiple sclerosis appear to have a temporal relationship with the invention of insulated footwear. And yes. I'm very interested to know who had multiple sclerosis in 1923 on the entire planet. Where yes. was he or she? And so again, we come back to Occam's razor. What happened to start this huge outburst of fibromyalgia and all these incurable difficulties? Diabetes is a big epidemic in the U.S. Oh. And also, Clint has a graph that shows diabetes goes up and in the same way where the shoes manufacturing goes up. So diabetes is also inflammation-based. The same, so, so, same thing. To ask the question, uh, Gaetan, you said that our atmosphere is less negatively charged and more positively charged than perhaps before. That, has that got to do with industrial pollution? What is the source of that uh, lack um, of, of our ability to get the electrons? Well, I want to say that first of all, this the, that the the uh, the fact that the air is positively charged has been true for all times. Okay. We do we it's not an, uh, uh, something that is recent. Uh, we do have regions of negative ions, like for example, if you get close to the ocean. So I'm fortunate to live close to the Pacific Ocean. So when you go to the ocean you breed also negative ions there. Some forests also have negative ions, but in general, most places are positive charges, you know, positive particles that we're breathing in. Now, I, the, our modern life, you know, has made things worse because now we have all kind of pollutants in the air. We have, you know, CO2 and we have many gases. I was looking into it, so it's like, there's a complex a mixture of gases now in our atmosphere that we're breathing every day. And um, these, again, increase oxidative stress because most of these molecules will be also charged positively. And the reason why you are po charged positively is because of the Earth's potential. So you have, by definition, you know, because when we talk about electric potential, you're talking about difference between two energies, you place with two energies. So by definition, uh, engineers and scientists have decided that the surface of the Earth is considered to be zero potential, even though it is in reality full of electrons. So but when you go up in the air, it goes, the potential goes up by about 100 volts per meter, 150. People don't realize that we're not zap. I mean, that's as much as the voltage that we have in our house. It's about 120 volts. In Japan, is it also that or 240? Or 240 in the UK, it's 120 here, yeah. Okay, so it's 120 volts. So, but the reason we're not zap is because the quantity of ions in the air is very small. Mm -hmm. So it's very low. Uh, but it's not zero. That's why if you, like, you walk on the park carpet, you charge yourself un unknowingly. If it's dry, you're going to charge yourself enough that if you touch a metal knob, you can have a discharge. And it's the air breaking down to let, you know, becoming a conductor because of the potential is so high. So it's not that there's absolutely zero ions in the air. It's a very, very small quantity. Nevertheless, the potential goes up, and when you go up to the ionosphere, it can be about 500,000 volts. That's normal. In fair weather, when you have a thunderstorm, then it goes into the millions and several millions of volts, tens of millions of volts. And the interesting thing is that the polarity is reversed. Now the clouds are ne charged negatively, and they're the one pushing negative charge into the Earth. And so, um, and also, that's why also... From the electrical storm, charging yes, the earth, is that right? Charging the earth. And that's the magic, is the magic happened in those thunderstorm clouds, which is a mechanical thing because, you know, the, the movements of ions, the air, the flow of the air and everything, somehow creates a separation of charge that pushes the negative charge at the bottom of the cloud and push them down to the 
to a point where the voltage between the surface of the earth and the clouds is so high that you get a static discharge. That's what a, a, a lightning is. It's like a huge static discharge because the potential is becoming so high. So, so actually, if we were to go out right after a thunderstorm to earth in a park or at the beach, uh, would there be some added benefits from the newly charged earth's surface? Or would it be the same zero potential? Would it make any difference? It could make a difference because what happens is this, is that when you have ex right under the thunderstorm, you will have the surface of the earth becoming positively charged, while the rest of the earth is negatively charged. So you have a gradient, a potential gradient there, you know. So I would say, you know, stay home until the thunderstorm is past and just uh, before grounding yourself. It's like uh, we had one case of one lady uh, who grounded herself in two different places at the same time during a thunderstorm, very rare occurrence. She was laying in her bed and she had grounded sheets that were connected to a rod outside her home. So that was one location. And then she put a, 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 a grounding band around her ankle and plugged that into the power outlet. Okay. So what happened is that now you have the grounding rod of the house and at a several feet, maybe like 30 feet, 40 feet, from a grounding stick that is in the ground. So during the thunderstorm, what happened is the potential between different regions of the earth, which is normally very much equalized, you know, the same everywhere, now become, you know, different. And it could be hundreds of volts. So at some point she felt a shock. And then uh, there's, a, there's a, a resistor inside the, the cable that just burned and that protected her, her because then it, it created an open circuit. So she just felt the shock. Without the resistor, it could have been worse. So the, 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 the thing is that during thunderstorm, be careful. Do not ground yourself at more than one point. You can still ground yourself at one point. But the problem is that um, if you touch something else in the house that is metallic like the the faucet or something, you might have a shock. It's not going to kill you, but it's not pleasant. So we advise people during thunderstorms, you know, just don't ground yourself, don't do anything, just stay home, and if possible. Right. Because uh, inevitably that question comes up in our lectures here in Japan, and uh, the only answer that I can come up with is, well, you've discovered one person that this happened to over, you know, more than over over 15 years, so it's a very rare occurrence. A very, very rare occurrence, but there is a resistor in the uh, earthing uh, cable that plugs in to the earthing sheet, which is there specifically for that purpose. Well, yes, to protect people I've from shock. Realized, uh, Gita, I've already realized from talking to you that you have such a wealth of information about this subject. I'm going to need a bunch of interviews with you. Okay. Uh, because uh, for, for the complete beginner, this is, this is lunar landscape level different. And I see. I don't realize that. You know, I've been immersed in this every day for, yeah. since 2007, really. Yeah. It was my main job. And you're already a grounded astronaut, you know, uh, and you've been to these places and seen these vistas and you've experienced the results. Uh, which we know are there because the Earthing book, which uh, was written uh, by I. Clint Obar. In 2000, there's two versions. Two, first edition was written in 2010, and the second edition appears in 2014. And there are three authors. It's not just Clint Obar. So that is correct. Who are the three authors again? Okay, besides Clint Obar, you have Dr. Stephen Sinatra, uh, very well known cardiologist in the US. If you Google him, you'll see he has a whole following and he has products and uh, newsletters. 
and Marty Zucker, who is a professional writer, who actually writes for Dr. Sinatra. I see. And so, so Marty was able to take, to collate a lot of this disparate information uh, from different sources. One is medical. Clint is definitely not medically uh, oriented to begin with. He was a, a cable engineer, which is how the That's whole right. story started. It's Another a, story, yes. A great story of, of transformation and yes. happenstance and synchronicity. I mean, uh, why didn't anybody else figure this out? Well, they, they did in Germany, you said. That's in the book. A hundred years ago at the sanatorium, uh, the really in, in, incapacitated people, there was no hope for, they yeah. thought, just chuck them on the ground naked. <laughs> yeah. to them. And, and that's why the spa comes in origin. Naturopathic medicine started there, and the spa started there, and they knew at the time that it's because of the, the contact with the, the earth that you have those benefits. And then this knowledge got lost because, you know, of the evolution of medicine, going into pharmacology and all of this stuff, and losing information about, you know, the electrical nature of uh, our our bodies. The electrical nature of your bodies. Give us a short snapshot of the electrical nature of our bodies, Gita. Yes. Okay. First of all, uh, we have uh, nervous systems, and we have the brain and the nervous system, which is well known functions through, you know potentials that goes along, you know, the, the nerve impulse and controlling um, the, the muscle, for example. Uh, they can control, you know, you have like the autonomic nervous system and you have the, uh, the, the, the peripheral ner nervous system where you can control your muscles. But all of this is electric. What has been found recently is that even the immune system and the, uh, the um, hormonal systems are modulated by the nervous system also through the vagus nerve, the biggest nerve in the, in the, in the body. Um, it was found that 70% of the immune system is actually in the gut. And um, that and the biggest modulator in terms of the function of the intestine is... Uh, the uh, the vagus nerve. In fact, there is a, a syndrome for you know premature babies, the preemies, that they die early, and call necrosis enterolitis, which basically is a necrosing of the intestine when the baby experiences too much stress. So the vagus nerve, you know, is not is hypofunctioning, and the baby is under stress. And that creates a situation where there's no nourishment of the intestinal tract and the baby dies. And so there's been a research project done showing that uh, grounding those premature babies help them tremendously to activate, the, it activate their vagus nerve. Even in the presence of the electromagnetic field that are quite intense, you know, in those incubators more intense than what we're submitted to. So we know now that these incubators and the electric fields there, in the electromagnetic field there, create a, a very real stress for the, these premature babies. So we're hoping that all hospitals in the future, well, starting with the preemies that are so sensitive that it will ground them, but the benefits for all patients, you know, it's for everyone. Yeah, that I are in the hospital. <clears throat> for any even non-medical person to read a report with such, in a sense, damning results. I mean, this is clearly showing that we are bringing our children into the world in the worst possible environment imaginable, which yeah. is disconnected from the very planet that they've just arrived on in the yeah. most sensitive condition you can imagine. Because the, yeah. And we still don't get it. And this particular study showed that just grounding these children would change their lives and probably save their lives. Save so, their lives. Yeah. There's enough information already in this interview for the perceptive listener to, to go, wait a minute, 
if even 10% of this guy's story is true, I need to check it out. Yeah. So that 10% oh. is enormously significant, but it's not 10%. It's probably closer to 100. Yeah. The fact that you've done these tests over a, a long period of time, you continue to get these results. I have just simply copied your seminal work and all of the Earth and community in, in America. I've copied it here in Japan because, of course, Japan is the most electromagnetically polluted advanced civilization that we've probably ever seen, and nobody is grounded. And people are stressed to the limit. And if the Japanese people weren't so damn tough, they'd be dying in the streets from this, from this level of ungroundedness. And sure enough, they're taking to it like ducks to water because they immediately feel, ah, oh, something just happened to my body. And yeah. I, yeah. I, feel, I feel, and there are feeling people beyond everything else. So I see that the future of earthing in Japan is being enormously uh, fast in spreading. And at the same time, the people in the box who run this country, the scientists and the politicians and economic, you know, gurus, they're going to fight tooth and nail to do everything in their power to disprove this simplistic nonsense. Yeah, we have the same, the same problem in the U.S. We have the same establishment trying to call us pseudoscientists and we're doing woo-woo science and whatever. And I can show you 10 websites with doctors and things who, they never check anything, of course. And their statements makes no sense. But for the normal person, one of the things, for example, they say that is blatant lie is that there's no peer-reviewed studies on grounding. This is a blatant lie. We have at least 15 of them that has been published in peer-reviewed journals. And, and they're all made by Clint Ober and his click, and that's not true. We have people in Poland that makes those research. The doctor who made um, the, 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 the Premie study has done it completely on his home. And he just asked advice, you know, how to do it properly. But he decided to do it, he implemented it, and he did everything by himself. And now we have other scientists that I'm talking to. It's catching on. More scientists now wants to do their own research on earthing and grounding and publish that. That's really my biggest role right now, is to spread the words to the scientists, to the medical doctors, to say, please try it with your patients. Do a small pilot. Try it on one or two patients for a couple of months. See, take your worst patient. See what happens, you know. That's all we're asking. And then after that, when you see that it really helps your patient, let's do a real study, you know, and let's get the word out because we're sitting on something that has immense, you know, benefits. I mean, if I, if, if I, let's say that, I would go to someone and said, what if I have a medicine that can guarantee that you'll never have any debilitating pain in your entire life? Would you, I will give you, but you have to pay a million dollars for it. The people will pay it. And it's free. It's free. People don't take it. I mean, it guarantee you no inflammation, you know, for the rest of your life. We had people in crippling arthritis pain after being grounded, you know, for years in arthritis pain, after being grounded, their pain goes away within a month. Yeah. I mean, nothing can do that. Nothing can do that. Uh, I've asked doctors in my class, can you in one hour do this? Because I ask people to actually say what percentage of your pain got reduced. Because you wrote it down at the beginning before we put the patch on you. And I'm getting answers, 70, 80% reduction yeah. in pain, 50%. Nobody less than 50%. And I then say to the doctor in the classroom, hey, how are you going to do that, mate? 50% yeah. reduction in one hour. How can you do that? Okay. Without any side effects. Without any side effects. You've got an injection. You've got an operation. You've got a pill. That's all you got, mate. So don't tell me that your science is almighty. Because <laughs> this yeah. is you skip from the earth. So we know we live in interesting times, and we know that we're going to have a lot of resistance. But like any other thing, I believe it's when the people themselves demand 
of their leaders. You guys got to start getting your research together because we heard about this, we're feeling it, and it's real. And you're still telling us this is Kuba, Clinton, some kind of cult. You know, when the people line up in front of the of the doctors and the scientists, then they're going to have to pay attention. And I think you know, I'm going that way because trying to go with your head bowed to some almighty scientist at Tokyo University to please do a study because it just might yeah. work. That will take me a hundred years. But yes. if a thousand women going up to the front door and saying, hey, we're great now because we did this, then they'll listen. And Absolutely. so I think uh, it, it requires immediate action. Immediate. You know, our, our health condition is horrendously, yes. tragically, tragically. I mean, I was in the States recently. I mean, this is a country of gigantically sick people. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. This, is, this is serious. And um, so in our next interview, which is definitely going to happen, uh, we're going to start slicing this up a bit more. Okay. People need more information on the electrical planet, the electric yes. you know, system we live within, uh, how yes. important electrons are to health and how grounding actually puts us all in a very simple package and how we can practice it on a daily basis and incorporate it into our uh, technology, our, our dental offices. All hospitals should have earth beds. Uh, we have now a society in Japan of very fast aging society. So every day a building will go up, which is an old folks home. Mm. And go in there, and it is nothing but proton city. Yes, yeah. if you find an electron, you'll get, you'll get money for it. The food is proton. You know, everything yes. is completely insulated. And these poor old people with Alzheimer's are going in the worst environment to put yeah. their body in. The worst. And they spend yes. billions of dollars on this, and the Japanese government supports this, you know? We're in the same situation here in the States. I mean, it's like, you know, big pharma wants people to take pills and wants the doctor to give pills. And I know personally a woman who is an attorney. She, before becoming an attorney, she worked for big pharma. And her job was to go to the doctors to talk to them about certain pills and then, and then promote and then those who were accepting that, they would be invited to uh, a seminar paid by the company in Hawaii. They will spend a week at the expense of the pharmaceutical company where they schmooze on how to use the pills, how to send them, how to... S and she's not joking. She said, I was doing that. I mean, I was one of the persons who was organizing those seminar where the doctor is free of charge, they spend a week in Hawaii at the expense of pharmaceutical company to learn how to use the, these products and how to speak to people so that they can sell more, more pills. I want, my jaw just dropped when I learned about this, like really. Well, there is hope yet. Uh, in closing, I know that you're working with the Chopra Institute and I know yes. that uh, uh, those What's the recent activity at the Chopra Institute vis-a-vis -vis grounding? Maybe we can close with that. Yes. Um, the uh, Clint notice, um, and, and you know, he walks, he is uh, uh, traveling quite a bit and see a lot of people and notice that the massage therapist and also Jim Oshman also has a lot of contact with massage therapists and realize that these people um, have a lot of pain and aches and uh, that is kind of abnormal because about 50% of them within about three years, they quit their profession uh, because they have pains, aches in the arms, and they just cannot do it anymore. And so we decided, uh, actually, Clint decided to do it by a very small pilot to ground a few people, ground a few massage therapists during their treatment, and they love it. And he said, I don't feel any much tired and stuff like that. And so I was friend with the director of research already of the Chopra Center. And I talked to him and said, you know, we have great results of grounding. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll talk to Deepak and see if we can do something. And so Deepak Chopra was open and said, okay, let's do a project. 
And so Clint met, you know, with, uh, with Deepak Chopra and with uh, the director of research there. We, we designed a project, we did it, and it was wonderful. One, one uh, paper on the biomarkers has already been published. And the other one is actually just being accepted for publication and uh, it's under revision, uh, the final revision for before publication. And so that's the situation with Derek. So Clint is there at the Chopra Center very often um, because it's a big place where they are and they have, you know, several events and stuff. And, and um, so it's been a blessing, you know, to be able to be in contact with Deepak Chopra. Well, that's, that's great. Um, we're doing the same here uh, in, in, at a very, very basic level. We're getting feedback from, first of all, the massage, the acupuncture community, the physiotherapist community. Uh, all of them are reporting fantastic results. Uh, for example, one practitioner would say, it used to take me about 20 minutes to get people loose enough to actually start the real massage. He said, now, instant. Because yeah. Matt, he said, you, you don't need any foreplay. You just go straight in there and you massage them and they're relaxed already. Yes. Uh, the most interesting results, uh, not practitioners of medical practices, but yoga practitioners have already uh, given us huge feedback that uh, using earth grounded yoga mats indoors immediately makes the practitioners more supple and so now we have outdoor earthing yoga events the, the name itself earthing yoga in japanese is asing yoga has already entered the, the, the consciousness of the people so that with a huge yoga community all over japan wow. i'm beginning to think well maybe instead of even using a yoga earth mat we just do it outside yeah That's on the other hand, people who don't have that information get out. There was a huge yoga gathering at Stonehenge this year, organized by the Indian government, right? Really? Yeah, all from all over of the world, all these yogis come to do yoga out right in front of Stonehenge, the most grounded symbol on the planet, and they're all on plastic mats with plastic. Oh, no. <laughs> what? Is the person in the yoga community gets it yet this is foolishness incarnate <laughs> yeah, absolutely so it's like people need this information desperately so my job at real rover is to just get it out yeah i really appreciate everything you've shared with us today uh thank you and your experience are vitally important to this whole movement obviously so i will get back to you with a second interview I don't, I don't thank know. you and what i'll do is i'll get this uh, subtitled in japanese that's why we're on the screen left and right okay so we can see each other's faces and we'll have japanese subtitles underneath it and then we'll release it in japan okay as you know down to earth has had over sixty thousand hits the japanese version people yes. are, it's, it's very well made and your part in that where you describe exactly the positive negative situation of the earth uh, is is brilliant so uh, thank I you. thank you for your time we've gone over 17 minutes okay I have a I have a request from Marty Zucker oh yeah I can you can see uh, we both can see that you also have a ton of knowledge and information on what your experiences has been with the Japanese scientists and practitioners and yoga stuff and Marty would like to connect with you because he's the one gathering the stories and everything. Even your story about bone density is pretty amazing. Yep. So he wants to work with you towards making new articles to revitalize maybe, you know, the Japanese area. And also, you know, what your share is, is good worldwide. You know, we need to get that to, we would like to get that to the Institute. We would like also, uh, there was a business situation there, like to know well, how we can work with you and some people so that we can, you know, help the Japanese people to have more of the products that they, that they, they, they need if they want. Absolutely, I'd be happy to do that. I'm, in, I'm intending to contact uh, Martin myself 
and uh, I'm going to be having a meeting in Tokyo quite soon with, okay. with people who are centrally important to this whole movement who okay. can get the staff together to collate all of this information from all over Japan. It's happening simultaneously. Uh, wow. Getting their stories and getting them in now, put in one place, and then we're going to have to get the stories into English, and then we're going to get them over to you. That's the project that has to happen. I mean, we can even do um, a Japanese website, you know, or something where yeah. lots of the stuff. So anyway, the... the uh, the possibilities are really great and really appreciate you know that uh, you brought me to your your show and to see that we are like minded people and we just want the betterment of humanity Absolutely. and uh, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me thank and you very much uh, dr Gaetan chevalier it's been a pleasure and a privilege talking to you today on real rover i'm going to cut the recording now and we're both going to disappear from the screen but i'll talk okay, okay. thank you sir thank, thank you, you. bye-bye